have you ever seen a jet be squawk free? No. That was the fastest <laughs> response. <laughs> we have had aircraft that have not had airworthiness squawks. So I guess the answer is, you know, my politician, yes and no. Hello, and welcome everybody to the Jet Life Podcast. My name is Tom Lelio. I'm your ultimate jet guide. And on today's episode, we're speaking with Warren Curry of Crew Chiefs. Welcome, Warren. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me. And, and I shamelessly am plugging uh, Crew Chiefs as I sit here uh, on your podcast, but uh, glad to be here. I love it. And this episode is made in a partnership with GLADA, the Global Licensed Aircraft Dealers Association, of which both Crew Chiefs and JetLife Aero are members of. So thanks to them. You know, I, I think what GLAD is doing is tremendous uh, across the board for industry, you know, and you see, you know, from brokerages to operators to folks like us that are more on the maintenance side of the industry. But uh, the sharing of insights and ideas and what's happening in the industry, uh, I, I find invaluable. So uh, I think it's a great organization and we're glad to be a part of it. For sure. And I think it's really important for for jet buyers that when they come into and they start working with a, a anybody in the in the industry, whether it be a mechanic, a pilot, uh, a broker, you know, it's good to know who is the company that they keep with. And by working with GLADA or organizations like that, you know that you're working with a reputable uh, individual. Yeah, again, can't say uh, enough good things about it. Well, Warren, you are the founder and the chief operating officer at Crew Chiefs. And I love this LinkedIn uh, bio that we have here. You founded Crew Chiefs to raise the bar and become the global industry leader in client representation for private jet buys, completions, and refurbishments. You are passionate about exceptional representation, unparalleled attention to detail, and objective consultation during these critical types of private jet inspections. And I love the fact that your your approach is to provide highly experienced professionals strategically located around the world. So you're not just like a, a mom and pop kind of a thing. And you're supporting this by quality management systems, reporting softwares to make sure that your clients are receiving unsurpassed client focused services. Your your tagline don't only don't be the only party not represented don't assume, verify. I love it. This is a company, you know, we're, we're solving some industry problems. And, and I know, you know, folks like yourself, Tom, operator, you know, it's, it's the standardization of this technical representation. There are great individuals doing this across the globe. Uh, but whether you have an aircraft in Hong Kong, London, or, or Florida, where we're at, um, you know, all going at the same time, you know, is the person on site? What checklist are they using? What type of reporting am I going to get back? Am I going to get a phone call, uh, a Word document, uh, a PowerPoint? We've eliminated those surprises. <laughs> yeah, 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 we had them all. And, and, and then as a broker, um, you know, how, how do you take that, digest it, and then, and then process it for a client? And so, you know, what, what we've been able to do, and we have 30, over 30 crew chiefs on six continents, you know exactly going in to every type of technical representation inspection, you know, what that checklist is going to look like. And then when you get the report, there's executive summaries for folks that maybe don't have the amount of experience and technical knowledge of aircraft. And we, and we try to use layman terms so they understand the what I call the bottom line up front, right? What, what if there's anything you, you want to know about what's happening, this is it. And then we have just pages and pages with pictures all uh, uh, well put together of all the technical aspects that, you know, folks like you and I have been in the industry a long time can really dive into and understand. So, yeah, we, we, we think we've we've solved that problem. And um, yeah, and we're passionate uh, about what we do. And so is our crew chiefs. They have uh, literally on average over 30 years in the industry. So we've been very fortunate with the folks we've been able to uh, bring on board crew chiefs around the world. When it comes to a pre-buy, you know, some guys have their pilots and their mechanics. And to your point, um, you know, if they understand their standardization, their systems, their process, they have a good relationship by all means. Let's let them go out there. Although there can be a benefit to a third party. Sometimes a bank wants a third party. Sometimes a buyer, a seller wants a third party, not the buyer's mechanic that's going to just knock them over the head. So you guys can fit into that space. But for the first time buyer that maybe doesn't have the mechanic in place yet, uh, the management company in place yet, you guys provide great services 
um, for you to be able to step in there. For example, the the deal we were working on, mm -hmm. we had a buyer in the U.S., a seller in Europe, and working with you, we were able to help coordinate someone to go to Europe to take a look at the aircraft on behalf of the buyer. And we even started coordinating the ancillary services like uh, the charter brokers and, and such. So you guys really do have a wide breadth of expertise that you can help with a number of, of issues that may pop up or problems that need to be solved in any kind of transaction. Yeah, you know, it, you're exactly right. We were working that. And, and again, uh, throughout this, I'll be very vague and because I don't want to talk to specific clients and aircraft for confidentiality, confidentiality purposes. But we're working a project right now with, with the seller. And, um, you know, what's really neat about and it's not me, it really is our crew chiefs that the folks that we have on board is as soon as we knew the type of aircraft, where the aircraft was at, you know, our crew chief that's regionally located, that regional knowledge is so critical. It is so critical. And the, and the networking they have that, you know, before the end of the day, when we first found out, we were already talking to the service center leads. We already knew the type of inspection that was it was going to undergo. The, the crew chief actually knew the aircraft, you know, not intimately, but knew the aircraft. So, you know, that comfort for someone that's not in the industry and they were getting going on the seller side of the pre-buy uh, to know that, hey, we got your back, right? And I hate to use that expression, but we really do. And, um, you know, our, our folks get on site or off site and they provide that comfort and, and protecting the interest. Listen, everyone in the is industry, there's no one trying to do anything uh, negative, right? But man, it sure helps to make sure that your representatives on there looking at your interest and to be honest, service centers and MROs are great. They make mistakes. Um, you know, maybe some of the younger technicians may assess an, an issue wrong. Um, they may bill incorrectly. Again, not not doing it intentionally, but we're really that auditing uh, consultation function to make sure that to the max extent possible, whether you're the buyer or seller, you're getting uh, the most out of that pre-buy. Why don't we talk a little bit about some nightmare stories? I mean, I'm sure you can you can share some some nightmare stories, or maybe knight in shining armor stories where you had the opportunity to to save uh, one of your clients from making a mistake, a costly mistake, because of of, of the pre-buy. Yeah, you know, and let me segue. So I'm gonna the the kind of maybe one of the largest nightmare stories slash. Um, uh, save the day stories really came into a heavy maintenance inspection. So let me briefly describe. Yeah, the, the, let's hit all three for yeah, sure. Yeah, briefly go. describe what that's all about. Um, what we're seeing from a lot of our clients is they have current clients that own aircraft that they sold to the client, and they're getting ready to go under a heavy maintenance inspection. It's well documented right now the bandwidth issues with MROs and service centers. They're overwhelmed. Again, great people, great DOMs doing great work. They're overwhelmed. And so we're getting a lot of clients saying, hey, can you go on site and just make sure that my client's 120-month inspection is going well? Make sure that, hey, really X, Y, and Z are the main focus for my client because they you know, are going to utilize the aircraft for this purpose, whatever the case is. So we go on site. And we're just there to facilitate, coordinate, and provide that level of comfort to the client that things are going well. And again, I'll say this in a negative way, and make sure the aircraft's not tucked away in the back of a hangar, somewhat being ignored. And it's not a indictment on a service center because they are all trying to do the best they can. Well, anyways, we have a client that said, hey, can you go take a look at this aircraft that was based in the U.S.? Um, we got told the location. We went to the location. That aircraft was not there. The, the, the client the client was unaware the aircraft was moved and was at a different location. So we became almost like a repo company, right? We had to find the aircraft. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so we, we were able to locate the aircraft through our network, literally calling and saying, hey, can you guys tell us if you might see this aircraft somewhere? Um, so we were able to do that. And what we had found was... Um, the aircraft was in a single private hangar. It wasn't in a service center. And there was just one individual working on the aircraft without their proper gear. Um, this client was spending a lot of money uh, for that inspection. Um, we did several video calls with the client who was actually not based in the U.S. Uh, describing what was going on, uh, what our recommendation was. Bottom line is, and it did cost the client a little more, 
because he was eventually looking to sell the aircraft within six months, we got it to a more reputable uh, service center that we knew folks. We were able to coordinate with that service center to bump it uh, to a higher priority based on what's already occurred to that client. And that way now he, he runs the course of, uh, and we, we kept in contact uh, and coordinated the inspection, but now he finishes the inspection, the aircraft is properly documented the heavy maintenance inspection it went through so now when they go to sell the aircraft you know all that has been done well it's been done by a reputable service center um, because otherwise anything that was done there during that heavy maintenance inspection would have been ignored by a potential buyer it would literally have to have just repeated the entire inspection so Wow. I, I would say that is one of our nightmare stories. Uh, not really associated with the pre-buy, but kind of kind of is. Um, you know, the, the other things, and this is talking general that we're seeing a lot, is out of Asia, it's a seller's market. And, you know, buyers are buying aircraft out of Asia. Uh, some are great aircraft. Some have been left outside. Um, you know, the amount of corrosion, pitting, leading edges... Um, and what we've seen is, again, this is indicative of all aircraft, but what we've seen on a couple is they're polishing the leading edge and leading edge services um, to a degree where the material thickness is affected. And, and again, if you're a buyer that purchased that aircraft without having, again, someone like crew chiefs or another, you know, very experienced technical representative, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, after ownership to replace all those lean edges. So it's simply, essentially, I hate to say it in this term, they're, they're putting lipstick on a pig, right? And, and they're polishing. So it, so the layman's eyes look and say, it looks great. Our guys are going in and, and almost without even the right proper tooling initially can tell you that material thickness is an issue and it needs to be replaced entirely. Well, kind of piggybacking off of that, can you describe this term that uh, a first-time buyer might hear, pencil whipping? Ooh, records and log books, right? That's, that's, a, that's what you're referring to. It's um, yep. So the pencil whipping is a critical, uh, you know, an MRO service center. And let's talk about bandwidth again. You know, where they are overwhelmed, they are trying to get through their inspections, uh, and they are simply. I don't want to incorrectly uh, documenting whether the aircraft has been worked on properly and all of the mm -hmm. due lists have been accomplished and or all mm -hmm. the compliances for SBs and, and, uh, and ADs, SBs and ADs, right. and you own or buy an aircraft and immediately that has to go back into a maintenance center uh, for almost a complete redo of a due list and or major inspection. So we have spent, some clients will have us go on site and we've done this up to three days of nothing but records reviews, law book reviews to make sure that doesn't occur. Um, and I highly recommend anyone purchasing an aircraft, you know, yes, do a pre-buy. Yes, have us do a deep dive. But, you know, ring the bell, stomp your foot, whatever it is you want to do. Make sure those records and law books are critical. You're taking a look at the records and you're trusting those records, right? And sometimes, you know, best case scenario, someone just kind of makes an error. Worst case scenario, someone's trying to, you know, pull the wool over your eyes. Being like, yeah, I did a phase one through five inspection. Yep, yep, sign off, it's done. And then you come to a pre-buy, someone like you, and you're like, you're looking at it, and you're like, there's, there's clear fuel leaks. Uh, there's corrosion all under the belly. Like, did you really do a phase one through five inspection and inspect all this? Because it doesn't look like it. And you signed off that this was done, you know, like yesterday, you know what I mean? So, um, unfortunately you know, that pencil whipping is definitely something you want to be aware of just making sure the logs represent what they're supposed to, um, for sure. I'm kind of curious, have you ever seen a jet be squawk free? No, uh, I, I can say that way. It, that's that's the easiest answer of the day. That was the and, fastest and, <laughs> response. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and that doesn't necessarily. So you, you have different right squawks. The airworthiness, obviously, are, are the largest ones, right? And we have had aircraft that have not had airworthiness squawks. So I guess the answer is, you know, my politician, yes and no. Um, yeah. Airworthiness, yes, we've gone through very well maintained, documented. Uh, care and fed for aircraft that had no airworthiness concerns. Um, what? And then what would you what would you categorize the levels as? Uh, of, of squawks. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, so, you know, I'm never categorized it this way, but I, I can do it. Air witness, obviously, are a top priority, right? Those are ones that the aircraft's not flying otherwise. I would say our second level squawk is uh, maybe not air witness, but pending air witness squawks. And what I mean is, let's look at, you know, brakes or landing gear or, um, you know, even certain aspects of corrosion where, and this is one thing we do pretty well, very well, where we'll tell a client, hey, you, you don't have any airworthy issues with this aircraft. It is in good shape. By the way, in the next 60, 90, 120, 180 days, these are items which are going to need to be replaced, repaired, addressed. And, and this is the, the somewhat scope of cost, right? Cost of ownership of aircraft. And you know this very well, right? How, how you educate clients on, you know, what this looks like, especially new first time aircraft owners, what this is going to look like in your first year. And so that's a second level set of squawks that are critical, maybe not time sensitive critical, where it has to be done before the aircraft leaves an inspection or a pre-buy, but it's, it's knocking on the door. And then I would say the third one is the aesthetics convenience. And that doesn't mean in some eyes of owners, aircraft owners, that that's less. I, they assume that we're going to give them as an industry an airworthy aircraft. But, you know, are, um, are all, I guess, are all the tables working? Are all the chairs sliding and functioning, right? Is there, is the carpet frayed in certain locations? One thing our tech reps, crew chiefs do very well because they've been in this industry for 30 years. They know the importance of that to a client. Is the Wi-Fi working? Um, you know, Tom, if you just sell a client an aircraft and crew chiefs just did a deep dive and we didn't check the Wi-Fi and he gets in or she gets in, her first flight, his first flight, that Wi-Fi is not working, that's critical, right? So I guess critical <laughs> means different to different people, <laughs> right? Um, so I would say those are the three levels. So it's, you know, the immediate airworthy concerns, it's the pending airworthy slash inspection items that are going to cost owners, uh, uh, you know, within the first three to six months or let's say year. And then it's what we may not concern, uh, categorize as critical, but the owners are going to categorize as critical. Let me ask you this. Can you like really quickly, like in 60 seconds, walk <laughs> us through a typical pre-buy? And what I mean by that is items you're going to want to do, and I'll name some of them like the law books, the test flight engines. But like curious, in 60 seconds, uh, what would be the typical items that you would recommend for uh, the average pre-buy? Yep, and we hit some of this already. Obviously, records and law books, Thorough comprehensive review, alpha to omega on on that. Uh, the 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 second would be you know your uh, exterior you know I come to a condition survey inspection items right from landing gear to pads to to the flight control functions. Um, I would say the the third is the bore scopes and that's a big issue right but we always recommend the engines are bore scopes it, 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 critical right so that that's really high up there and then I think you start diving into the the fourth level which I will say is critical for owners and that's the um, interior uh, aesthetic conditions or paint chips right not an airworthy concern but but that's right up there with what clients expect when they purchase an aircraft I think I did that in like forty five seconds. Dude, that was awesome. That was awesome. And and avionics too, don't forget your avionics yeah. checks. A hundred percent. And that's where we go into the, you know what, now I'm going to be over 60 seconds. So that's where we go into um, the, the flight. Uh, we call it a, a observation flight because we're actually not flying the aircraft, right? But when we do that, we are up with the pilots. We're checking the entire avionics suite. We're checking the data management uh, database systems. Um, and then while we're up in the air and they're doing their flying thing, we're in the back because, as you know, pressurization and altitude, things operate differently. So we've already checked every drawer, seat, table. We're going to do all that again. We're going to check laboratory. We're going to check the galley. Is the water functioning properly? We're going to do all that at altitude as well. So thank you for bringing that up. I missed it. Well, that's the thing. Like sometimes, you know, people uh, will ask me like, well, what am I doing a test flight for? Is it a uh, return to service, whatever? And And some operations – um, you need to check in flight to your point, like the avionics suite are, is, are, is the GPS capturing, you know, mm -hmm. um, the database, is it, is it, uh, up to date? Is it working pressurization wise? I mean, we just saw recently, unfortunately, you know, the, the citation right. that, that, that lost pressurization and, and, and that was, that was unfortunate. So 
the test flight isn't just to make sure that it goes up and down, but while it's in the air, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? We even have in our, in our observation flight, you know, what are noise, you know, we, we have the crew chief sit in different parts of the, of the cabin and, and for noise effects, right? Because again, you know, for, for people doing business, a lot of our clients, right, are, are traveling for business. They're doing business while they're in the air, right? That's one of the reasons they have it, you know, but if it's super loud and in, in certain areas of the aircraft, um, maybe it may need, it might not be fixed during the pre-buy, but if clients are aware of challenges like that, it uh, it, it works a little smoother for the broker post-sale. <laughs> I, I agree. That's great. Um, just kind of starting to wrap up a little bit. What would be a piece of advice or maybe a, a series of advice that you would give for first-time jet buyers? <laughs> Do, do the due diligence, you know, uh, and you know this as well as I do. The last two years have been frenzy and we had a lot of first time aircraft buyers kind of get forced. And I'll even be using the term bullied into purchasing aircraft without doing any due diligence of a pre-buy inspection. And again, I, we use the term deep dive, right? If you can't get into an MRO service center, you know, have a trained professional, crew chiefs, not crew chiefs. Regardless, have a trained professional go and objectively assess the aircraft. That's one thing that, that crew chief does offer to him. Again, shameless uh, pitch there, but it's the objective, right? We don't, we, we want to facilitate transactions, right? We want everyone to be happy when we leave. But to be honest, and, and this sounds a little harsh, we don't care about that as much as we care about a, a true objective. We're not getting paid by by either side of commission. We're not, you know, we're not going to use the aircraft afterwards. We just are telling you as of today on June 7th, this is the status of your aircraft. So my point is do the due diligence. They were bullied the last couple of years. We're starting to see that shift in the market with available aircraft and, and the sales cycles are extending. And I think that's honestly a good thing for industry. And I think it's a great thing for a buyer and a first time buyer where they can spend the time um, and properly assess the aircraft. The last thing I'll say for a first time buyer is understand cost of ownership. Um, and I, I know, you know, folks like yourself and great brokers explain that to them, you know, but you, you're purchasing a pre-owned aircraft um, you know, what does that look like in the in the next year? If you're getting a great deal, you know, what do those costs look like in the first 12 months? Let me ask you this. How does a thorough pre-buy save you money as opposed to just going out, taking a look at it and maybe trusting somebody? Yeah. But, well, well, the first thing is, is, you know, as you know, typical pre-buys, right? And, and the standard and every contract a little different, you know, airworthiness concerns addressed by the seller as far as the expenses. The, the buyer is going to address uh, and, and pay for non-airworthy concerns. Um, right off the bat, if you're a first-time buyer and you go into a pre-buy and you know you haven't purchased the aircraft yet, anything that is airworthy, you are, you know, that, that's on the cost of the seller. So you're already saving, you know, money uh, immediately up front. Um, I think that and this was raised really, isn't cost. So that's saving uh, the money and it's uh, saving you time. But one last thing too, I'm going to jump around. I apologize. The other way of saving money and time is to have someone like Poochie's, a technical representative, maybe take a look at the aircraft even before the APA sign. And we get a lot of this. Hey, you know, we have an aircraft in London. We think we might want it. Can, can one of your folks in Europe just go spend a day with the aircraft? Right. And, and we're not going to catch everything in a day, but man, we'll catch the, the big old gotcha moments. Right. And, and that way you're actually saving money, even flying an aircraft to a service center for a pre-buy or going through and, and, and paying some of the legal fees to, to scope out the APA. Right. So we, we are literally, you know, one day could either give you the reassurance that your money that as a first time buyer that you're going to spend getting the aircraft through a pre-buy is worthwhile or it's not and it's, it's time to shift gears and move and we can do that on site we can even do remote records reviews um if given access to uh the document i was talking to jason uh zoberbrand from vref uh, a while back and we talked about this idea of a pre-buy you know it's a snapshot in time you speak into this idea that like well if i get a pre-buy it's basically like a warranty. I mean, isn't crew chiefs just warranting that the airplane is going to be perfect? You know, next time I go fly, we want, we want to speak into that a little bit. Yeah, warranty boy, the word warranty scares me. I think of the legal stuff, right? But but uh, I think what you're getting at is it's it's a snapshot. Maybe, maybe I understand the question. It's a snapshot in time 
I, I think it can be used as an assessment of what that aircraft's going to look like over the next, you know, several, three, six months. But it's it's certainly not, uh, if you're a first-time owner of an aircraft, first-time buyer, it's certainly not a guarantee that three, six months out, this is what the aircraft's going to look like. As you and I know very well, things change very quickly, you know, depending on the use of the aircraft and, and you know, hopefully not, but any kind of damage that occurs, whether it's in a hangar or a hard landing, you name it. Um, but, but I still think that pre-buy at least eliminates a lot of stress and anxiety uh, for a first time buyer that, you know, as of today, I'm in a good position and I got a good aircraft. Now, w what that aircraft looks three to six months ago is probably very indicative of their uh, care and feeding of that aircraft and their usage. Yeah. And I appreciate that. You're just reiterating the point, like, listen, this is not a guarantee. It's not a warranty. This is a snapshot in time. And as of like, what we see today, this is the report. Now you can make an informed decision about it. That's a great way of saying it. Absolutely. I'm curious when it comes to the difference between part one, part 91, when it comes to the difference of part 91 versus part 135 maintained aircraft, if someone finds a 91 aircraft that they want to put on a certificate, how big of a deal is that? Yeah, and, and again, I you know well, I wish our, our CTO uh, Mark Tebow was online because he'd be able to he'd be able to speak here for the next thirty minutes on it. This is exactly what he does, right? But I will tell you this: from listening to smart people like him and a lot of our crew chiefs, one of the services we can provide is that conformity, the Part ninety one, the the assessment of that conformity, and that's not a two hour uh, process. <laughs> I'll tell you that you know that that can be days because it's it's obviously both you know, records and documentation, but you're also at the aircraft too, right? You know, making sure that, you know, the, the interior, exterior, what will it take to modify the aircraft for that conformity leap from that 91 to that 135? Um, and we get, and I'm trying to be very vague, we'll get operators that will ask us to go look at certain aircraft because, you know, they have folks that can do it. They're overwhelmed. Hey, crew chiefs, go spend two days with that aircraft and tell us mm. what will it require to get this thing from part 91 to part 135 conformity. Like you said, you have max 91 aircraft. You have not so max 91 aircraft, right? And and it, it could be very um, costly um, uh, to do so sometimes. And other times it's, it's not. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but it is a uh, – okay, good. Should sellers be afraid of crew chiefs? Because you, you, you see a lot of times like sellers, they have their mechanics. And if a buyer wants to bring in their own mechanics, it's like, oh boy, here it comes. They're going to ground my aircraft or, you know, they don't want to take their aircraft to a service center because it's been maintained by, you know, their mechanic for so long. They don't want it to be stuck there. What, what are, how do you speak into those, into those concerns that a seller might have by having a third party like crew or specifically crew chiefs uh, come in? Yeah. It, it, um so first is, and, and we do, like I said before earlier, uh, we even represent sellers sometimes, right? Uh, we'll be on site representing the seller uh, during that. You know, we'll look at, is the scope of the pre-buy the buyer's asking for appropriate? Is there oh gotchas? Hey, the buyer's asking that it needs to be conformed to these following things upon sale. But does our aircraft conform to those following things? So, but to get back to the buyer, um, if we're representing the buyer, should the seller be concerned? Absolutely not. One of, again, we're objective, but we really do want to facilitate transactions, right? We, we are we are industry fans. We're industry partners. Uh, we don't want to go in and you know simply break glass and and leave and you know we're the smartest guys in a room and and so we showed you that that is not in fact one of the key aspects of people come on board crew chiefs is a bunch is is their soft skills we know you have 30 plus years of aircraft do you have the soft skills to navigate a dom a buyer a seller the respective agents the brokers to to identify challenges and problems with aircraft but also find ways to facilitate the resolution of that so that everyone walks away, you know, 99% happy, right? No one's going to be 100%. So I always say, oh, 9%. And we do so in a way, and I'll be honest, I've even had brokers from the seller side reach out to me after transactions and say, you know, not only do I want to use you guys next time on my side, but the experience was fantastic. Thank you. And I say, yeah, yeah, well, we want our client to have that same level of appreciation, but you know, if there was someone to reach out 
on the side of, let's just say the other side, right? And say, hey, your guy was fantastic. The relationship, the, the, the process um, was great. And I can't wait to work with you guys. That, I think that's probably one of the best compliments we got. So the answer is no, um, unless you're trying to hide something. If you're trying to hide something, you know, if you're trying to get something uh, over on the, the buyer, then maybe yes, you should be. <laughs> you're going to find it. <laughs> well, let's, I love that. Thank you so much, Warren. Let's shift for our final question. Let's shift to brokers. How do you guys support us brokers? Because I, you know, I'm a, I work, you know, I have my own agency, Jet Life Arrow, and I'm not a mechanic, but you know, it'd be nice to have someone I could just call up and ask some technical questions too. Is there anything that Crew Chiefs does that assists brokers? We do. Well, first is brokers is, is I don't know, percentage wise, it's, it's over 50% for certain uh, of our client base, right? Um, so, you know, we, we are talking to brokers on a daily basis. Uh, but to get to your point, we do have a tech net goal. Uh, because, you know, maybe some larger brokerages might have two or three, um, you know, technical folks, former DOMs on their payroll and, and they can support the brokers that are worldwide with questions specifically to uh, technical aspects of the aircraft. But a large majority of broker and or brokerages do not have that. So we set up tech goal and what that allows is someone like yourself, Tom, to call us up and say, hey, I think, right? I think this is what I'm trying to do. But, but, and listen, I am not a maintenance engineer either, right? I, I, I know a lot, but I know a lot, I know enough to be dangerous as well, right? So, but you might call me up and say, I think uh, this is what I want to do. I think this is what my client wants to do. But I have a question on, you know, uh, a 337 that we know about. I have a question, you name it, right? What do you think? <laughs> well, what is a 337? Oh, it, 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 yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a major alteration or, or it's usually attributed when people use that term because it can mean a lot of things to damage. You know, that could be hangar damage. It could be, you know, what people refer to as hangar rash. It could be a hard landing. But the point is, you could, you know, you call us and say, what do you think? Will this change the scope of what we should look at in a pre-buy? Um, should we just change the, 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 the way we scope the, the overall contract itself, right? I might not have the answer. Even our CTO, uh, who is 40 plus years in the industry, might have the answer. But we have over 30 crew chiefs. I guarantee we have the answer, regardless whether it's a Falcon, Gulfstream, a Bardier, Textron, you name it. Um, we have the folks that, you know, within 24 hours, we're going to give you uh, uh, the most educated answer. So it's a Technet Gold program uh, available for any broker to sign up. Uh, they can cancel it. It's a monthly subscription. They can cancel it anytime they want. Uh, but it basically gives them a hotline. Uh, it gives it gives them their own tech ops team uh, that you might see in larger brokers brokerages organizations. Gotcha. And do you want to speak into costs? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the cost is five ninety nine a month. Um, again, there's it's it, it's you pay monthly. So if the um, uh, you use us for a couple months, maybe, maybe let's say this, usually the end of the year is when the industry gets most frenzied with transactions, right? So maybe it might be, hey, you know what? I know I'm going into, you know, from August to December, I'm going to be overwhelmed. I just need, you know, a, a team of experts on my side, right? You, you pay us. And oh, by the way, and I don't want to get into more uh, costs, but when you do sign up, you also get different incentives if you do use us on site. Right. So if if you're using our tech and that gold and, and then you want us on site to represent you, you're going to get discounts on that. So, you know, it's a way for us. Yes, it's, it makes us money. Right. We're all in business. But it, it also, uh, you know, allows us to, to provide support for the industry that that we think is is well needed. Awesome. Well, Warren, thank you so much. Uh, is there anything else that you'd want to share? How can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about bringing out crew chiefs for their pre-buy or if they're brokers and they want to find out more about your support programs? Tell us a little about where the people can connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. Go to our website, www.crewchiefs.com has all our contact information, uh, phone numbers. Also, you can reach me uh, directly at warren.curry at crewchiefs.com. Um, feel free to email us, call us, uh, love to you know talk. And oh, by the way, uh, we generally mean this. I always tell brokers, clients, operators, 
even if you think you might have a project that you might want us to support, and we understand sales are crazy and last minute it changed directions, get a hold of us early. I'd rather you, I'd rather get a call and say, hey, I think in like two weeks I might need you guys in Hong Kong or Sydney, you name it, to do X, Y, and Z. I, I'm not, you know, going to commit or get upset if the deal goes sideways or you go in a different direction and use somewhere else. But it helps me scope out, you know, again, we do have over 30 folks. We're always doing projects, but it helps me scope out my resources and where I think I'm going to be allocating people to. Um, and it also, um, I think by the time if we do get used and we get on site, it um, provides a little better support. Because we, like I said, the, the one we're doing right now in, um, in London you know, as soon as we heard about it, we, before the client told us, we knew serial numbers, we knew end numbers, we knew where it was at, and we knew the folks at the facility very well. They were getting ready to do the actual three by inspection. So it, it, it in, in the end, pays dividends for effectiveness too. For sure. For sure. Well, thank you so much for being a part of the of the podcast. I look forward to seeing you uh, in the near future on the podcast again. And I definitely can speak to, you know, the ability to reach out to you and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this deal. You've been super helpful uh, with the past transactions that we've worked together with. Thank you, Tom. It's my pleasure. And thank you for having me uh, on your podcast. I appreciate it.